Amen. Amen. Can we give it up for Addy? That was sweet. That was a that was a mouthful. Well, hey church, how's it going? Happy Sunday. Um, y'all don't know me, and you're like, who is this guy that is dressed like he is from uh, some urban other world? Um, so I, my name is Thomas, and I bring greetings from the nation's capital, from Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I live in Washington, D.C. and work for a local church there. And the band up here is also part of a movement, but also local churches called Passion. And maybe you've heard of it. It's been around since the late 90s. And man, the mission of Passion is the glory of God. And uh, the target of Passion is 18 to 25-year-olds. And our goal of the whole, we, we still... Uh, strive to be local churches for everybody, but specifically for 18 to 25 year olds, we want to take people who are just living a life on this world and completely reorient their life toward the glory of God. And so if if you're not familiar with what passion is, uh, look look it up, man. It's really awesome. But uh, over this past weekend, uh, aside from passion, it's been an incredible weekend. And uh, we had D now. Uh, We called it Encounter Weekend. And I believe the Lord encountered us, and we met with him, and we learned about him, and, and we saw the risen Jesus Christ, and hopefully our hearts were changed by it. But the path we've kind of been on is in the Gospel of John, which I have right here, uh, at, the end of, at the end of his Gospel, he said Jesus did a ton of things. He did a lot of signs, but I chose these few ones so that you'd believe in him, and that you'd, you'd believe he's the Christ, and that by believing in him, you'd have life. And so, and so he only includes seven signs. He includes seven miracles, but he calls them miraculous signs. They're not supposed to make you go, oh my gosh, Jesus is amazing. Do your thing, Jesus. They're supposed to make you go, whoa, that makes sense of my life. That makes sense of what I'm going through. That makes sense of why he came and why he came to do what he did. And so there's seven of them, and we've already gone through three of them, but the culminating one is Jesus raising Lazarus that we just talked about. And so I'm going to pray, and then we'll talk about it for a little bit, and then that beautiful voice will come up here and we'll worship God. Uh, Father, thank you so much for a beautiful Sunday in Bernie, Texas, and thank you for the local church. Uh, God, before I came up here, I was just thinking about how uh, at one point Jesus looked out at the crowds, and he saw the crowds, and He felt like they were sheep without a shepherd, that they were harassed and helpless. And God, it's wonderful to look out at a crowd like this and know we're not that. We're not sheep without a shepherd. There's great leaders here. There's great people here. We've been attached to the great shepherd. And so, God, I thank you that you've taken us under your wing. God, I pray that our hearts would be restored this uh, morning. And then, God, I, I, I do. I pray that our lives would be changed for the first time or the thousandth time. Uh, that looking at you wouldn't get old. That it would change us just like the time it changed us and we came to know you. Or if we don't know you. Maybe today we'd know you. And then if you're willing, uh, maybe you on your own pray and ask God to teach you. Well, Father, we love you so much, and uh, we thank you for this morning, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may not know it, but there's a trilogy of uh, books and movies called The Hunger Games, and I, I guess I didn't get in the know with my generation because I just watched them for the first time. And uh, I have the type of personality where if I finally find something I like, I can't put it down. So I, I marathoned all the movies, and, and they were absolutely mag- they were absolutely captivating. If you've, I haven't read the books. I'm Gen Z. I only watch movies. And so, and so I watched the movies, but they were absolutely captivating. But what was different about this story was this girl named Katniss Everdeen, and she, she's the protagonist. She's the hero. And what's interesting, and you know, she rises up from the impoverished district uh, to take over the oppressive capital who is uh, just throwing evil and chaos into everything and killing innocent people. And she's the one that rises up, the humble, poor girl that rises up uh, to conquer evil. And, And I think I loved it because I was so attracted to Katniss Everdeen, not just because Jennifer Lawrence was playing her, 
but also because she was a hero, not like heroes in other superhero movies. That she was strong and she was the best fighter there was, but she was sentimental. That she raged at evil, at uh, President Snow, the guy who was like the face and the epitome of evil. She rages at the thought of him. And as the time comes when the two of them are going to come face to face at the end of the story, she begins to rage. But despite that rage, it, she's not above weeping about the hurt of the world. That even though she's the hero, she's not numb to the hurt of the world. Now, why do I, why do I mention that? Because at the culminating sign, what John writes about who Jesus is, why did he come? You have the greatest hero ever looking at the worst enemy ever. And he's not a hero that's just up there that kills an ant like you killed this morning and just says, well, it's done. He looks, he looks at the greatest enemy and he's the greatest hero. And then he looks at the hurt in the world and he's sentimental about it, but he's also strong. He weeps, but he rages. And that's what we have in this story. That's the picture John paints for us. Uh, so I want to look at three aspects of this story. First, Jesus' response to death. Second, Jesus' rage at death. And third, Jesus' reversal of death. Uh, first point is going to be longer, and so don't let it set the tone. I promise this will be the longest one. Jesus' response to death. So you have two sisters. You have Martha, Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus who has passed away. The disciples are like, he just fell asleep. And she's like, no, he's not asleep. He is dead. And, uh, and he's very straightforward about that. You're like, Jesus, I thought you were boys with him. And then he waits four days to make sure he's dead until Jesus comes into town. And so Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, are, as you would be if a sibling passed away, absolutely upset. And they, they both have these words in their mouth that this is not the way life is supposed to be. Like, all of us can relate to those words. When someone passes, it's not supposed to be this way. And then, and then they do have the courage, and I don't think it's uh, wrong courage, to say, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And we see through his interactions with Martha and Mary, they're very different, but we see he is the wonderful counselor, like Isaiah says. Jesus is exactly who you need him to be. Not when you, not when you want him to be the way you want to be. He's going to be who you need him to be when you need him to be that. And uh, Jonathan Edwards, I love this. He says, how do you know someone is a Christian? He goes, they're not obsessed with the power, the authority, the sovereignty, the control of God. He goes, they're obsessed with God because he's like the wonderful counselor. That he's holy, he has power over all circumstances and situations, but he's merciful. He's like Katniss. He's powerful. He's the strongest warrior in there, but he's not above weeping. He's truth. He'll be honest with you, but he's grace. That's what John said. He was full of what? Grace and truth. That's the counselor you want. So first with Martha, Martha comes to him and so, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have been dead. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. So she doesn't rebuke him. She just offers words of grief and faith. She doesn't say, you should have been here. She just says, I'm upset, God. I, I wish you were here. I wish you could change the situation. And then Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And she receives that as, well, yeah, I, I know that he'll rise in the resurrection of the last day. And, you know, she has no clue that this man's about to say, Lazarus, come out. She's like, yeah, obviously. In the end, everything's going to be okay. She's looking far down the road, but she's saying, look, Jesus, I know that it'll raise in the last day, but one day, someday, that, that you're talking about, it's not today, and it doesn't feel good. And so for her future belief that everything will just be okay one day, that when, maybe when a storm happens to your life and you're just like, everything's going to work out, everything's going to work out, it'll all be good in the end. Jesus confronts her and says, that's not enough. He, in, he says, your belief about the future must always invade your present. It can't just be some distant thing that everything's going to work out in the end. And so what does he reply to her? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He's saying, I am the future hope that's come to invade the present. He said, he's trying to divert her mind, and many of us have to have our minds diverted of this, of we have to go from some abstract belief about the last day, that has to come all the way to the present and invade everything in our hearts. Everything must go from some, oh, everything's gonna be okay, to a pulsating personal belief in Jesus Christ. Because he looks at her. She says, things are not as, supposed to, as they're supposed to be. Maybe one day they'll be okay. And he stands in front of her. He says, I'm everything you're looking for. You want everything to be okay? I'm everything that's okay. I'm everything that you're looking for in this moment. Are you hurt? I'm everything that you can find healing for. And so he confronts her with truth. And then he even goes to say, do you believe this? And uh, it's interesting. At a funeral which it looks like I'm dressed for one, Jesus is confronting her heart. He just took the subject off Lazarus and turns to Martha and says, I am the resurrection in life. I'm everything you're looking for. All those hopes you have about the future, I'm it right now for you. And some of us have to have this view of God radically changed in our mind. That he'll confront us sometimes. He'll be a counselor that says, you need to wake up. I'm the resurrection in the life. And then Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. You're the son of God who is coming into the world. Now, this is beautiful. What is on the other side of a confrontation with God Almighty? Confidence. That he just confronted her and said, wake up. I am the resurrection in the life. And then on the other side of that, she has confidence and says, you are the son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the one that's coming into the world. Uh, so so he, he diverts her, her mind from having some abstract belief about the future to a pulsating, present experience with the Son of God that changes everything in the now. So it's a belief that the future invades the present. Um, and then it's beautiful. He gives truth to Martha, and he gives tears to Mary. In verse 28 and 29, Martha calls her sister Mary the te- and says, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, this is beautiful. There's two different things that can happen. Maybe maybe when something really bad happens in your life and you know someone who has uh, wisdom, power, control, uh, you could, it'd be like a pastor. There's a difference between if, if you had a family member pass and you calling your pastor and be like, I'm going through a really hard time. There's a difference between this and you have a family member pass away and before you can dial your pastor's phone number, he's the first one at your house. This melts your heart. This isn't bad, but this type of counsel, this type of love melts your heart when he shows up before you could even say anything. I, I remember this as a kid. There's a lot difference in being a kid and really wanting to talk to my parents about something going on in my life And then finally gaining the courage and going up to talk to him. That was great. But when I knew something was wrong and I didn't have the courage to go up to my dad or mom, and they came in the room one night, and they saw the look in my eyes, and they knew something was upset, and when they said, let's talk, I broke. When the person of authority and power and comfort and wisdom finds you, that'll melt your heart. Good news is, that's who Jesus Christ is. That's the wonderful counselor. He calls Mary and he says, I want to meet with you. He doesn't wait till Mary says, I need to meet with Jesus if he has time. He says, Mary, you're the first thing on my calendar. Do you know that type of God? And then in verse 31, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus wept. A whole sermon could be given on that. The shortest verse in the Bible, the easiest to memorize, maybe one of the most profound. The God of the universe, the one who spins the galaxy on his pinky, the one who created all the stars, all the sun, 
the, all the suns, which is a star. He created everything. He makes it rain. He makes it sun. He does every single thing. He created you, and he is not above the suffering you experience. Jesus weeps. Um, and then it's interesting, that word, when it says Jesus wept, it isn't, it isn't like the public wailing that other people are doing. Uh, it's a silent cry that's almost to himself. That, that it gets him deeper. Uh, and, it, and it makes you think, man, he was probably weeping for Lazarus because he was close friends with him. He was weeping for Mary and for Martha because they're devastated. He's weeping for the Jews that are with him. But in a way, it makes you think he was crying for all of us. And maybe you could read those words and apply them to your life, that the Son of God is not above weeping and being hurt over the suffering in this world. That he is agonized with the terrible pain of death itself. The terrible power of death disturbs him to the point of mourning. I love this. One writer said, he cried. He knew Lazarus would be alive again in moments, but still he cried. He wept because knowing the end of the story doesn't mean you can't cry at the sad parts. We don't have a God who's uninvested. We have a God who's mega invested. And just because he knows the whole story doesn't mean you can't cry at the sad parts. I love this. Uh, in C.S. Lewis's work, The Magician's Nephew, in the, in the Narnia series, there's a young boy named Drigory, and he has a sick mom. And Aslan, if you're unfamiliar with the story, is kind of like the Jesus uh, king figure. And Drigory, uh, Aslan is wanting Drigory to help him do something, to accomplish something for his kingdom. And uh, Aslan says, I asked you, are you ready? And Drigory said, yes. And he had for a second some wild idea of saying, I'll try to help you if you'll promise to help about my mother. But he realized in time that the lion was not all the sort of person one could try to make bargains with. But when he had said yes, he thought of his mother and he thought of the great hopes he had and how they were all dying away. And a lump came in his throat and tears came in his eyes and he blurted out, Please, please, won't you? Can't you give me something that will cure mother? And up till then, he had been looking at the lion's great front feet and the huge claws on them. And so now in despair, he looked up at its face. And what he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life. For the tawny face was bent down near his own, and great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. And they were such big, bright tears compared with Drigory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. My son, my son, said Aslan, I know. Grief is great, and only you and I in this land know that. Drigory looked down at this source of power and majesty and might, and he saw his paws and he saw power. But when he looked up, he saw compassion. He saw a king who cared. Uh, do you know this Jesus? Do you, have this big, do you have this big of a view of Jesus? That he's holy, that all things were created by him and through him and for him. But he's the king who cares. He's not above the hurt. Uh, like on a personal level, do you, do you really have this concept that Jesus is, is saddened by the things that harm you. And he is saddened by you being marginalized in whatever part of life you're in. That, that Jesus looks out at all the suffering, all the oppression in our world, and is a king who cares. He's not, a, he's not some guy on a throne who is completely above everything and, and so far up that he's above the hurt of this world. He's the king who cares. So in his response to death, he offers truth and grief. Uh, but then we also see uh, he rages at death. In verse 38, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb and said, take away the stone. And here we see he's not simply sad, he's outraged. 
Jesus is raged at death. That word, he is deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. Uh, extra biblical Greek, as in that, that present time language that wasn't used in the Bible, would use this word as furious indignation. It's like outragement and unsettlement. They would use it for horses that were raging in preparing for battle. Jesus is raging at the, at the look of this tomb and at the look of death. He's overcome by the horror of the human dilemma under sin and death, and he's filled with anger. He's upset of death hanging over all of humanity. Why? Because Death is the final enemy. This man looks at the tomb and says, that right there is the antithesis of everything I'm about. That's the ultimate enemy. Now, I, I want to press this for a second. Some of, some of us are going to watch uh, the Super Bowl tonight and be raged at some initiatives of commercials we see we're going to be raged at maybe some of the language used in the post-game interviews. We're going to be upset about maybe some of the things that are shown on the halftime show. And I'm not saying that that rage is bad. I'm, I'm no judge of righteous anger. I just want you to know the Son of God, you know what he's raged about? Death. He didn't show up and say, I'm, I'm raged about what the conservatives are saying on Fox News. He didn't come and say, I'm raged about what the liberals are talking about. And I know this more than anyone living in D.C. The people are raged. He says, you know what I'm raged about? Death. That's what prepares me like a horse for battle. That's what I came to defeat. Now, there's two kind of ways you could view death. There's the modern way, which hasn't hit us, but it, it will hit the United States in at least the next two decades. It says there's no life after death, that death is just the fulfillment of your existence, that life and death weave together like harmony, and death is a friend that you meet at the end of your life. That's the way people are going to start thinking about death. That's what, if you read the smart people, if you read the nerds nowadays, that's what they're saying. That's just a friend. Or there's this worldview, the one that we have, that there is a life after death, and therefore, death is the antithesis of life. The two are polar opposites. They are separate powers. And death corrupts everything that life grows. Death is like weeds. Life is like flowers springing up from soil. Now, he's outraged because of death. Now, this leads to a problem. Because if the wages of sin is death, then we've earned death. And if there's a life beyond death... And behind the curtain is a judge. We're not good. And so the question is, if he's raged and ready to destroy death, how can he wipe out death without wiping out us? And so I'll end with Jesus' rever reversal of death. In verse 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out and his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth, Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I love this. One, comment, one commentator said, the authority of Jesus is so powerful that if he didn't specify, come out Lazarus, there would have been graves, people coming out of graves all over this town. That's, that's crazy to think about. And so here, here is good news. If he tells Martha, wake up, the resurrection is more than just some future event. It's something that changes your present. Here he shows us, oh, but it's great hope for the future. Resurrection is not just heart change. Resurrection is every sad thing coming untrue. Resurrection is bodily raising from the dead. Not just us floating on clouds singing hallelujah. It's body. It's, it's everything you hoped for. 
Um, but, and so, he, so he, he comes to bring resurrection, bodily resurrection, heart resurrection. But the scary part about it is if he's come to knock out death, you're like, this is great that you raised Lazarus, but what's scary about death isn't, isn't just being in the grave, isn't my body being six feet under the ground. What's scary about death is guilt. Paul says, what is the sting of death? Sin. What makes death so scary for people in the world? The top two fears, public speaking and death. <laughs> why, why is death so scary? Because we're afraid when we, when we get that, we're afraid that there's a door and there's a curtain there and that behind that curtain there's a judge and all wrongs and all rights will be judged. And then you see that, you see that door, you see that curtain, you see that judge, you say, I'm not good. So what really makes death scary is I'm guilty. What really makes death thing is I'm sinful. Uh, now don't hate me. Um, what, uh, recently I have fallen in love with Harry Potter books. Um, I, was, I did not grow up in a home that supported the Harry Potter books. And so I did not know much about them, but... I, I am a huge Tim Keller fan, and I was listening to a Tim Keller interview, and he was talking about the time when the Harry Potter books came out. And if you think about it, the Harry Potter books were the last book, last fiction book to ever have like people lined up around stores. Like people went crazy. Now it's not a thing anymore. Now we just have the internet, and we drown ourselves in it. But uh, this was like the last big thing of history, pretty much, where people were lined up outside of thing. And I had never paid Harry Potter much attention, but Tim Keller was talking about this time between uh, the last book about to come out, and it was months leading up to the last book, and everyone was arguing, how's it going to end? How's it going to end? How's it going to end? You know, it, it was, everyone was talking, people at coffee shops were talking about, how's Harry Potter going to end? And uh, Tim Keller says he remembers, like, he was in a room with a bunch of friends, or a room like this, and everyone's arguing, and he said, Harry's going to die. And they were like, you're great, what? No, he's the greatest wizard in the wizarding world. Like, no, he has, to do, he has to defeat it all. He has to be there for it all. He's like, no, here he's gonna die. He, he said, the only way you can defeat death itself is if life goes down beyond death and proves it's more powerful. And, it, and, then, and then that's what happened. Harry, the chosen one, the way he defeats the grave is by giving up himself. And you know, it's interesting. You ask J.K. Rowling where she got that story. She said, what did I write on the tombstone of Harry's parents? It was the Corinthians verse. Who is the final enemy? Death. Uh, and, so, and so the same story is true for us. The only way Jesus can say, Lazarus, come out of that tomb, is if he himself goes in. The only way life itself can destroy death is if life itself says, I'll take it. Um, that's how he removes the sting of the death. That's how he conquers death. Uh, I love this story, and I'll kind of end with this. Donald Barnhouse was a pastor of Philadelphia 10th Presbyterian Church and uh, a prominently well-known pastor. And when he was young, his wife died, and it left him with his young daughters to raise and he did something probably none of us in this room could do. Uh, he conducted his own wife's funeral. And it was while driving to this funeral that he realized he, he had to say something and explain to his girls to somehow put into perspective what was going on and something that even he himself was struggling with. And so they stopped at a traffic light uh, while they were driving to the funeral, and it was a bright day in Philadelphia. And as they were stopped... Uh, a truck pulled up next to them, and the shadow that came with the truck darkened the inside of the car. And it was then, as the car was shaded in the shadow of the truck, that he turned to his daughters and he said, would you rather be hit by the shadow or by the truck? And one of them responded, Daddy, that's a silly question. The shadow can't hurt you. I would rather be hit by the shadow than the truck. And then it was then that he tried to explain to them that their mother had died and that it was as if she had been hit by a shadow. It was, if, it was as if Jesus had stepped in the way in her place. 
And it was as if he was the one who had been hit by the truck so that when death came, she just experienced a shadow of it. And so he's removed the sting of death. He's abolished its effect. He's taken the fangs out of what made it poisonous. And so it's a present reality. The resurrection is not just something we look forward to that says, oh, it'll all be okay in the end. It's the crux of everything we believe. Resurrection means death's been defeated. The snake's fangs have been taken out. The bee's stinger has been moved. And so now when it hits us, it's a shadow. Because the real thing hit him. Uh, it will be a beautiful day too when he comes, when real resurrection happens. The trees will sing, the mountains will roar, the ocean will cheer. And when, when that happens, we'll say, we're home at last. This is our real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life. And I, perhaps I never knew it. And it will by no means be the end of the story. I love C.S. Lewis says, all the adventures we ever had will end up being only the cover and the introduction. And finally, at that day, when we do see that day that Martha was talking about, We'll begin chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and which every chapter is better than the one before. Do you feel the warmth in your heart this morning? That's the resurrection. It, it's a future belief that invades the present. It's the resurrection. And that's not a feeling. The resurrection is a person. I am the resurrection and the life. I am that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you sent your wonderful son, the great counselor, the mighty God, to conquer death for us, to remove the sting of sin, to take the hit of judgment on behalf of us. And so now we, just get, now we just experience a shadow of death because he's abolished the real thing. And so God, I pray that the thought of resurrection would change us, that yes, we'd have hope that one day we would bodily rise from the grave and, and live forever like everything we've ever wanted, but that that future reality would, would come and invade the present. And I don't, I don't know what that means for you today, but it means something for all of us. We all have family. We all have a job. We all have a neighborhood. The resurrection must invade the present and it must invade the day-to-day -day of our lives. And so Christ, we fix our eyes on you. You're the wonderful thing we hoped for. You're the wonderful thing we need. You're the wonderful thing that's come to save us. And so we sing to you, we praise you. We love you. We sing, we sing about a God who came to rescue us. And we're going to sing about that forever. In Jesus' name.